Shalom from Jerusalem. My name is Albert Wexler. I'm the director of Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast. And we are here at the Friends of Zion Museum with answers for our allies. Together with me is Jake Fishman. He's the leading expert in digital communication, social media, leading government advisor on international media here in Israel. So thank you. Thank you, Jake, for joining me. And um, today is the, the day of prayer, National Day of Prayer. And it's a very important initiative that mm -hmm. came out of the former Knesset member, uh, Yuda Glick, and then the Knesset picked up on it. And so it's very, very important that everybody would pray for our friends. And we have, of course, all of the hostages mm -hmm. on the big screen behind us, and uh, we want them home. But you have been working very hard in uh, creating a lot of uh, media content, and uh, maybe you can talk about this a few sure. words. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think as all the viewers know, we're at war, both here in the land and digitally across platforms. Um, everybody who follows the daily updates of what comes out of Israel, what Hamas is posting on channels, uh, what's being prioritized, fake news, um, it's, it's just, it's a real war. And uh, people across the world who want to support Israel and, and want to know what's going on um, are also at a fight for understanding what is truly legitimate content and what is not. And so um, today what we have is essentially the government working in, in three, different, three different levels, right? So we have on the ground, we have digitally across the world in terms of information, and now we have a day of prayer today, which is uh, a fantastic initiative. And I think that uh, what we need to see here is the world also coming to a place where it uh, joins hands with Israel in a deeper way on these three levels in terms of support for what's happening on the ground, uh, support in terms of the digital platforms, people voicing their opinion and finding the truth and sharing the truth, uh, and then, of course, coming together with us in this day of prayer today. Now, tell me, how come Hamas is creating this fake news? I mean, they had uh, Islamic Jihad uh, rocket misfire, it landed on some uh, parking lot. Mm -hmm. They uh, faked the news that Israel had bombed the, the huge hospital in, in Gaza Strip. And to this day, New York Times, BBC, they still cannot you know, s say the truth about this whole situation. How come that they are fed by these Hamas uh, fake news? Uh, sure, so it's, it's really twofold. One is the content itself and the way that it's put out. And the second is what people want to hear. And so uh, what we have is October, October 7th happened and there was a huge push for Israel. There was empathy, there was sympathy, there was connection. Um, often what we see around the world, also with the Ukraine situation there, where people really push their identities into these social movements, right? They say, I, I empathize, I connect with, I stand for, right? Good. However, uh, what we see happening is the shift in empathy, right? And so this is, this is the mass shift, and this is where the New York Times, the BBC, AP, all, all of the biggest channels follow this mass, right? And they, they go with it, and then they encourage the further fringing of it in certain areas. But what we saw is, is mid-October, there started to be a shift. And the shift happened right as the IDF started to enter Gaza. And so what we had is the empathy shifted, and it left Israel, and it went to Gaza, essentially. And so the younger generations, especially under 25, right? There was a report that came out by Harvard recently that um, college students and under 25-year-olds, uh, almost 50% empathize with Gaza, Hamas, right? And 50% just over side with Israel. Now, the numbers, once you get up from 25 older in terms of the, the generations, you do get more tipping towards Israel. And it's this graph that just, you can't, you can't miss it, right? And so what we have is that when this empathy shifted, so did the news, right? So the conservative news sources still go with a, a more Israel empathy or empathetic you know, position. However, what we have is, is a mass that now is, is pushing or already walking totally into this, let's say, Palestinian empathy situation where black and white Israel's bad guys and black and white Hamas slash Palestinians are the good guys. And so to your point, what that feeds is a desire for this content, right? So you mentioned one piece. There's another clip that was recently put out that was uh, Hamas uh, essentially firing an RPG. You can see kind of from behind his shoulder, firing at an IDF helicopter, and it hits it, and it crashes the helicopter, right? 
and so this created a lot of cheering, a lot of... Uh, millions watched it. Millions. Millions liked it, and tens of millions saw this. And so what they find out is that this wasn't a real video at all. It was actually a video game that they pulled out a section of this and, and tailored it into a fake video, right? And so they're very good at this, and they don't care that it's a lie. That's not, they're not looking for integrity of journalism. They're looking for riling a, a rally cry, right, and pushing people into a place where their team is, is winning. And so that's what we have today is, is this two kind of two parties together pushing, pushing away from Israel and pushing into this more fringe perspective of even pro-Hamas and pro-Palestine. Pro Isn't it interesting that there is... Uh no need for truth. They just need the perception and they just need to, to play into the, the, the given situation and uh, that's all they need. By the way, these demonstrations, pro-Hamas demonstrations, mm -hmm. and they're massive, they didn't start when Israel started the land incursion, they started way before. Mm -hmm. So they were kind of celebrating also the, their quote-unquote victory, which was horrible in my Understanding, so they don't care for the truth. How come? What what makes this generation to to run for their lie? Yeah. So so I will say that we we play the same game, right? So we create content that grabs. We create content that that's dramatic, right? And October seventh, unfortunately, there's so much dramatic content. Uh, we work hand in hand with the government and the IDF to receive this content that is just horrifying. Um, but we have to show it to the world. And so this, this desire for drama, this desire for something spontaneously engaging for our emotions is, is a driving factor in social media. The, the dopamine, right, that we look for, and, and this is something that everybody knows and everybody plays into this game. However, uh, the younger generation, this again, this 25 and, and younger, even let's say 30 and down, um, is raised in this. Right? They're raised in this world of quick and fast and surface and headline and first three seconds, right? There's a reason that in the back end of, of these platforms, the algorithm works on three second views, meaning if a person views a video for three seconds, that's counted as a quality view. If they view it for 15 seconds, it's called a through play, which means a real quality view. So if in today's world, algorithmically, three seconds qualifies as gathering information in 15 seconds, is, is stated by the world's biggest platforms as a quality view, an absorption of content, then that says who this generation is, right? Mm -hmm. We're three second and 15 second generations versus you know, the older generations are, are demanding credibility, fact checking, right? They want a little bit more substance. And so what we have today is, is everything is rushing into this position of the younger generation in terms of, of feeding that three second and 15 second uh, view count. Mm -hmm. It's um, so un unfortunate, really, to, to, to see this. You have been, of course, doing a lot to uh, help our hostages, to make people aware of what has been happening. I mean, for me, to see the, the, the video clips where, you know, young people, elderly people rip off, rip the, yeah. the, the kidnapped yeah. posters from the walls, I, I can't understand why, why. Why is it? Why are they doing this? That's a good question. Yeah, again, it plays into people's assimilation of their identity with social movements, and so people are looking for this, and we've seen this for more than a decade, right? We see people assigning themselves to, of course, political parties, which is standard. However, we have everything with with genderism. We have everything that's coming out of, um, let's say, the progressive positioning right in, in the West and people really attach themselves and this this goes all the way up into the world's biggest brands right so if you look back over the last 10 years you'll see Starbucks Airbnb Walmart right some of the world's biggest brands pairing themselves basically giving up their logos to cheerlead a social issue to become social activists right and they don't do this simply because this is something that they want to do or they feel good about this or convicted but it's a marketing play right and so what they do at the same time, like I, like I talked about these kind of two dancing parties, right? This, this, this news source and people, brand and consumers, right? They kind of do this dance together where they push each other further and further into the assimilation of their identity with these, with these social issues. 
So what we have today is, is that people are much more driven to show themselves as a show, social activist, right? And so what we have is, again, two parties that are battling, those who are for, those who are against. And what we see today is, unfortunately, I would assume those who went out and put up those flyers did a, a little bit more quietly than those who went out and ripped them down, if that makes sense. Meaning that those who would say they are in favor of uh, destroying Hamas, bringing home hostages, and bringing justice out of the situation have become more and more quiet and concerned about their, even their safety than those who, by the hundreds of thousands, are rushing London, Berlin, Washington, Oslo. Right? Oslo. You know, this is, they're loud and proud of their stance. Meanwhile, a source told me that there was a planned march, uh, I believe in Texas, for uh, pro-Israel who were trying to come kind of and bring this contra again to the loud voices that were, that were anti-Israel. However, the police told them they recommend they don't do it for their own safety. And so they didn't. And so this is the situation that we get in is, again, that we have these two parties dancing. They either push themselves together further, brand, consumer, so to speak, or two parties who are stand against one another, that one becomes very loud while the other becomes more quiet. No, something is, is not really, uh, I cannot connect the dots. The police tells them not to go out to do a pro-Israel demonstration for their own safety. I mean, the yeah. police, who is supposed to protect the demonstrators, is telling them not to go, because we will fail. Yeah, I, I saw it when I first heard it as, as them caring, meaning we really see a threat. We see enough of a threat and conflict mixing up in all of this. And they see the protesters, you know, they, they, see, they see both sides, because they're there for all the protests. They're, you know, they're, they're there guarding, they're helping, right? And so I think they see just the, the fire that's burning and they know what could happen. They know that there could be kind of this explosion of the two sides meeting in a sense. And, and because of that, they say for your own good, really consider. Really unfortunate, in my opinion. Much. Really, I mean, I understand that there can be, there can be intelligence about some really evil uh, attacks planned. And, but I would really ask our friends to, to continue to pray, especially on this day of National Day of Prayer. And, uh, not to give up on, on uh, you know, going out and, and demonstrating for Israel. I know that in Czech Republic, the, the parliament, parliament had, uh, they printed out these posters of these precious people mm. that are, you know, kept in, in the dungeons of, of Hamas and, and they placed it on the, on the chairs mm -hmm. uh, in the hall in Czech parliament. And uh, I, I, I wish many other parliaments and many other uh, congresses and, and you know, uh, legislatures would do that because this is so important. I mean, I, I mean, it's a month now that these people have yeah. been maybe Captive. haven't seen the sunlight, yeah. haven't seen, haven't felt the fresh breath of air. Right. Some some dungeon, you know, you don't under, you don't know what conditions they are in, how they are treated. I mean, I'm praying that these Hamas people would would be afraid to you know, mm -hmm. do any further damage to them, but it's, it's, it's so horrible. Yeah, it, it's, it's just unthinkable. It's just unthinkable. And, and what we have going on today is a lot of really great organizations are telling their stories around the world. And I think that that's a great way to, again, maintain some of the empathy for Israel is to really continue to show what happened and what's happening. And so I know that this kind of, we've reached this kind of stagnant point uh, where people have left and forgotten a lot of the atrocities that happened on October 7th. And a lot of these faces and names have kind of fallen to the back, background in the West. And so I think that the best thing we can do is continue to refresh, unfortunately, refresh the memories of the masses of what happened. And really, again, keep, keep a, front, a front place for, for all these hostages, 240 estimated, right, that, that are still there. And these are just innocent people. I mean, some are soldiers, but I mean, we look at these faces, many are over the age of 60, many are children, right? And this is, this is an atrocity that continues to happen, right? And so I think that in terms of everybody voicing their message and standing with Israel, it's, there's never enough times that you can share content that tells the story of one of these individuals or tells the story of what happened to them. Um, 
and I think that this is a way that we can continue to, to kind of keep this flame burning uh, until they're all brought home. There was one now, uh, Ori Megidish, who, who uh, was uh, actually freed. I really am really uh, praying for more miracles like this. Again, the price, of course, for such operations is very, very yeah. heavy, very high. And um, Israel needs a lot of uh, intelligence and, mm -hmm. and, and really help of other nations. I mean, I'm, I'm also thinking about, you know, um, there was talks about Sweden uh, um, granting the citizenship to, to all these hostages because Hamas was doing this selection. Like if you have a, a, a foreign passport, mm -hmm. you have a dual citizenship, they would let you go. The same did the terrorists did in, in Entebbe. They, they first separated the mm -hmm. foreign citizens and then uh, the Israelis were, of course, uh, liberated, freed by, by uh, IDF. Brilliant, mm -hmm. brilliant operation. But um, I know that there's, there's been uh, reports about uh, Israeli airplanes in, in Egypt. Our leadership is there. Obviously, there is negotiations going on. It's such a dilemma. I mean, think of this. You have to free uh, terrorists uh, so that you can get the hostages yeah. home. And you know that many of these terrorists that perpetrated these atrocities this time on October 7 were freed in Gilad Shalit deal. So, I mean, it's, it's so hard dilemma. I, I can't even think of, 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 you know, what could be offered on a negotiations table. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to know, and we'll see everything as it, as it comes out. But, you know, in terms, of, in terms of, you know, the terrorists continue to be operable, I mean, they, they continue to push their way in with ambulances, ambulances, as we know, right? And the U.S. has confirmed this. I mean, they, they try to smuggle Hamas yeah. terrorists out on ambulances, yeah. right? And yeah. then they try to get them out uh, as, uh, what was it? There was some uh, humanitarian yep. uh, escape or whatever it was. Yeah, and it's, and it's interesting because the first, the first supply truck that was let in, there was a report that came out that the, the Israeli government did not check or the UN did not check any of those vehicles. And so they came out, and I believe the US also confirmed this, but that it, that it was checked. And so you had this, 24-hour period where the world, and especially Israel, understood that the UN had not done their due diligence to actually check these trucks, right? And so you have this kind of this war, this tension going back and forth that almost you could say that the media plays with us or, or we get played with in some way in terms of our emotions and our Big perspectives. Time. And it creates, it creates rage. And so you hear the story and the amount of people that hear that story the first time, then those who hear the correction is a fraction, meaning, meaning those who actually hear the truth at the end are, are a fraction of that, of that number. And so you also have this across Twitter, where you'll see sometimes underneath uh, a post that says that this is questionable or this violates community or we don't believe this is true, right? And so it's kind of a warning to help people to understand that, that this may not be true. However, it continues to allow it to run, right? And so what we have is a situation where the content is going out and even Twitter has, has admitted to mistitling information and saying it's fake when it's actually true. And so you, the, the platforms are doing the best they can and the world is too in certain cases and others there's deliberate you know, harm being done. But it's, it's a real challenge, especially now with, with AI and with what you can generate visually, tricks that you can make. Um, it's really, really challenging. It's scary. I mean, AI, you can, you can uh, re take a recording of somebody's voice and, and, and image and create uh, something that yeah. this person never said, never would say, and, and then start uh, blackmailing the mm -hmm. parents or whatever. Yeah, and, and even with that, so the EU reached out to Elon Musk and said, you have 24 hours to do a full review of these issues that are happening with, with truth and non-truth. So the EU did step in, and they're big hitters when it comes to punishing platforms. They're very good at this. Um, and so Twitter itself also got pushed into this place, right, by the, by the EU essentially. But the other platforms are so behind. And the reason is, is that after COVID, right, there was this huge, massive layoffs. You probably read about this with Facebook, 10,000, 10,000. They laid off all these people. Who are these people, right? Specialists. Uh, exactly. And a lot of these specialists, their job is to check content. So first content gets pushed through a computerized check. So it looks for keywords or imagery of political officials, things like this. 
And then based on its evaluation, it allows the content to either go far or not, especially in the advertising world. Any content that's get, that, that gets promoted, paid, uh, most people have probably seen this if they boosted a post before. It will go into a review session, which takes three hours to 24 hours, somewhere in there. And what's happening is the computers are checking your content. They're checking for keywords. They're checking for, again, you know, items that could be political or social issues. And if they identify something, they reject it. Right? And so all of these people that were working at Facebook, at Meta, many of them, their jobs were to, to be a human check right? or to be involved in the initial process or processes after that. Right? And so what we have is that uh, as, as soon as October 7th happened, you had this flood of content right? and this massive wave of information that the platforms were not ready to contain. Meta didn't have the manpower. Right? Um, Twitter was... <laughs> had just deregulated a lot of things. Musk had deregulated a lot of items in terms of freedom of speech, which could be looked at as good. But however, when we stepped into this new era that we're in, it became very problematic. And so you had this deregulation and this downsizing of companies paired with this unseen wave of information that needs monitoring. And they're just not there. And the last thing with that is that during the, during the time of COVID, I don't know if you remember this, that on YouTube and across different platforms, especially YouTube, you would see this, this disclaimer about content that was, you know, speaking maybe mistruth about the virus or about things that had to do with COVID. And, and you would hear also on the conservative side, doctors that would say their content was taken down or, right, you get strikes on YouTube, things like this, right? And so at one point, they said, um, I don't know if it's the CDC or the U.S. government itself, standing that uh, misinformation about COVID was essentially terrorism, right? So they paired, because you're essentially, you're essentially bringing people in a state of fear or even death, right? By bringing, that was their assumption, right? Or their declaration, rather, is that if you give misinformation, that's terror. You're creating terror, right? And so you have that surrounding virus. However, what we have now is it's just silence. I mean, the platforms are, are so wrapped up in dealing with, with gender issues, right, domestic issues, right? They're so focused on these, I don't know how I'd call them, you know, human progressive liberal issues, and that's where they're investing all of their time and the resources. How do we stop, you know, gender issues from happening and people getting upset with one another on the platform in terms of these things? And they are not prepared or at all to deal with items like this. Well, uh, Jake, you've been really instrumental in um, having the government press office uh, uh, run very successful Christian media summits and, 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 and getting the message out um, to the whole world. Now, this year, what is happening with the, with the media summit? We definitely need a Christian media summit right now. I mean, if, if ever, this is the moment. Yeah, um, every year we have the Christian media summit and the Jewish media summit both towards the end of the year. Uh, and about six years running now. So this year should have been the seventh. Um, didn't happen, uh, unfortunately. Well, it's still not too late. I think uh, we can, you, could, you could pretty much run it also on the digital platforms and, and not to do a physical uh, in-person gathering. Mm -hmm. But like uh, you know, the COVID times told us, you can work in hybrid format. Yeah, and we have, uh, I don't remember the exact number. I know it was above 2,000 foreign journalists who are here, mm -hmm. who are present in Israel right now. I don't want to write me this morning, actually, also coming over and looking for a press card. But um, yeah, it's, it's a time that journalists, it's, it's not hard to find content to write about Israel. Right? However, there's a need to experience. And that's why I'm very happy there are thousands of journalists here, is because that's, that's them doing their due diligence to actually see what's going on. And I know there was a at least one one group of journalists, I hope many, they went down to Beiri and Kfal Aza, the places where these atrocities took place on October 7th, within the first week and saw what took place. I know that many of your good friends and, and colleagues in the Knesset also did this and saw what really happened with their own eyes. And many of them, while they were down there, had red alerts, right? They had missiles, rockets coming over from Gaza at the time they were down there. And so even on CNN, there's, there's a video of a reporter you know, taking cover. I don't know exactly where she was, but she was taking cover, experiencing what we experienced here in the land 
what now, 6,000? More than 6,000 times in the last Well, month. I think it is now up to 10,000 rockets. 10, That's what we are talking about, yeah. Yeah. So to really experience that and feel that, even if, even if you're alone in, in the field or if you're with a family who experiences this on average once an hour in the course of, you know, seven days down in the Gaza Strip, I mean, it's just, it's something you can't experience, you can't know unless you experience it yourself. But hopefully these journalists do a good job of bringing that message through uh, and that they continue to do that without again, giving away their sympathy and giving away their empathy and, and, and giving it to essentially our counter enemy. But I still think that this Christian Media Summit as a tradition should be continued and I think we should have one this year. I don't know what our viewers can do. I mean, write to the government press office, say we need more information. I mean, you, you guys are creating so much of content. I mean, and it's so, it's vital, it's important to have it. Because, um, I mean, otherwise, there is no vacuum, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's all kind of junk flying in. Yeah, that, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we as an agency, we're reaching over a million people a, a day um, with, con with this relevant content uh, on behalf of our customers, you know, which are mostly nonprofits or, um, you know, advocacy groups who are looking to actually move the needle <laughs> Now, t tell me more about it. You have a company called Goldfish Marketing, and you are giving your services to many very important uh, organizations, not just the Israeli government, but also um, Shurat Din. Talk about this a little more. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so we typically we work with both for-profit for companies and non-profit companies, organizations. But uh, today, the, the non-profit organizations are much more prominent in terms of the Israeli humanitarian aid organizations or those who are advocating for, for good or for truth or justice. Um, so you mentioned one, Shurat Adin, who's just an unbelievable organization started by the Mossad or in deep connection with the Mossad um, that has taken terrorists to court as well as defending those who were hurt by terrorism or the relatives were, were murdered by terrorists. Um, and so one of the biggest issues and items that are on, that are on the table today are, are three, main, three main groups. So. You have uh, the International Red Cross, you have the UN, and you have, today is interesting, is women rights movements, right? And Me Too right, movements. And so one of the key issues that we're, we're trying to work on today is to really push a wave of support for there being a voice and being words coming out of the mouths of these organizations, right? Declaring that this was wrong, that this is atrocity, right? And so you have universities across uh, the West, right, who refused, their presidents refused to make a declaration that Hamas is a terrorist organization. Well, you, 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 you have so many who have refused to yeah. make such declarations. It's just such a shame even to think that this is going on. I mean, we were asking uh, the other week, where is the Pope? I mean, the, mm. the, the head of the Catholic Church should take a stand, you know, at least say what Hamas is doing. I mean, is to be condemned. I mean, it's it, the silence is, is just deafening. Yeah. yeah, and that's where we're at today. It's, it's really that organizations, public figures, politicians, leaders of large schools and, and organizations are kind of at a crossroad. I mean, it's really a T. And silence is a declaration, in a sense, especially when there's a call to make a statement, and there is none. And that shows that there is either deep ties, personal convictions, or board convictions or donor convictions that push, uh, push that individual into a place where they are, essentially their hands are tied. They feel that they cannot stand out and make a declaration, even if they wanted to, right? So you have this whole back end that's kind of puppeting what we have, but then you also have those who really believe that Israel is in the wrong. They really believe that we should not be in this land. They believe that we are doing misproportionate uh, retaliation against Hamas. Uh, and so what you're led into is, is this place that the, the body of students at universities are the best voice. Parents are the best voices. And so writing open letters, everybody out there, writing open letters to uh, you know, your local representatives, congressmen, mayors, uh, the presidents of your school, these are real ways to move the needle. They really make a difference. They really do. I, I truly believe that. I've seen that. And so what we need today is, is more parents, students, uh, business leaders, right, public figures to make declarations very clear, black and white, 
that Hamas, what they did on October 7th, is an atrocity. It was murder. It was rape. It was, it was the worst side of a human being. Right? Even kind called them human beings. But they documented it. They had the GoPro cameras on. And, and, and Israel has a lot of this footage uh, of, of these horrible things perpetrated. Now, uh, how can people see this? I mean, mm -hmm. I understand many people would not ever want to see this, but at the same time, there is this truth of the 7th of October that has to be seen. Where can they find this? This is a few places. Um, you know, the IDF's channels are, are, are very powerful. Um, the Prime Minister's office uh, channels are very powerful as well. And then there's a whole kind of widespread grass movements of, um, you know, bring them home, um, bring them home now. You know, these, these sorts of uh, hashtags, you can search for these things, you can see real content, you can see their stories, you can see how they were taken, how many of them are paraded around Gaza, you know, how many of them were murdered. It's just, it's really hard to watch the content. Horrible. It's, it's unbelievably hard. but. I believe that if people start to feel callous, if they start to forget what happened and start to focus on headlines and casualties of war, because there are casualties of war, and every, every government that goes into a war makes mistakes. And so these mistakes are going to be under the microscope, as they already are, of what the mistakes the IDF makes or uh, casualties of battle, of war. Um, and these things can create a callous, and they can start to break down our empathy again and our, and our connection with with really why we're in this war, that, that no one wants to be exactly. in. No one wants this here. We're losing, we're losing brothers and sons, and, right, in, in, in IDF as they're battle, you know, battling in, in, in Gaza. We're being terrorized by, by missiles flying over our heads. Our kids are you know, in and out of schools. Our economy, I don't know what's gonna look like. Well, it costs us $1 billion a day just to, to, to keep going in this, in this um, uh, situation where the reserve uh, soldiers are being called up. It's, it's a very, very, very uh, painful uh, and very expensive uh, kind of a time. But at the same time, I think th there, must, there must be a, uh, a, a possibility that, that people would, would uh, see the facts like they are. Mm -hmm. And I remember last week we had uh, uh, Rabbi Adlerstein say, um, you know, people stand up and say war is not the answer. But at certain times, war is the answer. Yeah. It's, it's a horrible statement. But during the Second World War, when six million Jews were uh, massacred and, and, and murdered in the death camps, war was the answer. This was the answer. Allied forces had to give that answer to this world because Nazism had no other, you know, answer to be given. I mean, they had to be annihilated. And the same is with Hamas. I mean, you cannot even think any rational being, any human being cannot think that you can have the most uh, horrible murderers as your neighbors, and they're not relenting. They're not having any remorse. They don't care. They want, then they declare it. They would do it again and again and again until they erase Israel. So how, how, how do you... How do you deal with such people? I mean, the war is the only answer. I'm sorry to say that. Yeah, I think one of the best questions that you can ask a person who, who would maybe, let's say, side with the fact that the IDF is doing the wrong thing, or that Israel is, is being non-proportionate, right? And, and you see that they stand with the Palestinian people in Hamas in terms of the occupation, right, of them declaring that they do feel like the, that the Jewish people have taken their land, and, and this is just a, well, we a consequence it. of... They had all, right. of, all of Gaza Strip. They have it since 2005. Right. So you ask that person, you say, well, what part of Israel proper do you believe should be given back to the Palestinian people or whoever? And you'll see 99% of the time they'll say all of it. They'll say, there you go. So you stand with the uh, defining perspective that the Jewish state of Israel should be annihilated entirely, should not exist. That is what you're declaring, and everything else that you're saying is a justification of that perspective, which existed long before October 7th, right? And is now coming into a place where you can, again, realign the empathy of, of, of listeners or people, realign their empathy with the, the suffering casualties of war, which many of them are at the hands of Hamas, clearly. They're hostages of Hamas. <laughs> I mean, all of these people, I mean, they don't allow them to flee, to uh, be ev evacuated to the southern part of, of, of Gaza Strip. They've been shot. 
by, by Hamas people who try to, to escape. Right. And, and then the spin is the empathy creation in the West for, for the children and for the women and for those who were, who were killed, the Palestinians, which every life is valuable. And, and we all agree with this, but what you're saying is, is absolutely true. There's black and white, there's good and evil in this world, and evil showed its face on October 7th, and evil exists today in those same people, and in the people who have been, unfortunately, brought up in this way of thinking that are around them, right? Which many of those in Gaza, uh, a young man who grew up in Gaza, right, who converted to Judaism, is now spoken out with that perspective openly and publicly in Israel proper, it says that everybody, everybody who's grown up in Gaza in the last 30 years, right, just less than 30 years, has been indoctrinated in schools with this exact same jihadist perspective. It's, it's a closed vacuum of influence, of Iranian influence and jihadist ISIS influence. And unfortunately, that's what these children and anyone under the age of 30 has been raised in. And so liberation of the Palestinian people from Hamas is the most empathetic and righteous thing that we can actually do is unleash them from the hands of evil dictator terrorists who are run and controlled by billionaires sitting in Qatar, five-star hotels, while their people are poor and suffering. Right? I mean, we have several billionaires, several. I mean, the, all of the leadership has become uh, so wealthy. It's just yeah. unbelievable. But again, we, we are not here to um, solve this yeah, sure. problem over the over this uh, Facebook Live, uh, but we are here today uh, on the National Day of Prayer to encourage you to pray. I mean, the world is in a mess, and you can see that, that these kind of ideas and this sympathy towards Hamas and, 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 uh, and Gaza is spreading all over the world, and it's your home where it is spreading, and, and you, you cannot predict even what's going to be the next step they will take, because uh, their, their goal, I mean, if you... If you look at the Hamas uh, program and if you look at what they are saying, it's not just to kill all the Jews and it's not just to erase uh, Israel. Their, their goal is to take over Jerusalem and the whole world. They want to create a worldwide caliphate, an Islamic regime. And, and they have not, you know, ha you know any remorse, any, any change of mind over this. They are proud over their, over their goals and, and what they want to accomplish. So we need to pray for Israel today because what starts with the Jews never ends with the Jews. And we need to pray that this evil would be eradicated. There must come a stop to Hamas and all these ideas that they are spreading all over the world. And thank you, Jake, for sharing today. I mean, it's, it's uh, people like yourself that can really bring an answer to much of these uh, fake news and, and what is being spread. So remember, those who pray for Jerusalem will prosper, and those who bless the seed of Abraham shall be blessed. So on this day of prayer, shalom from Jerusalem.